Today we will learn and reflect on the work in the Philokalia by St. Diodocus of Photiki. St. Diodocus passes on the teachings of the Eastern Church Fathers who precede him, and he also adds his emphasis on the need for love. And as St. Paul exhorts us, every Christian should seek faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. And like all of the Eastern Church Fathers, his writings quote scripture constantly. At the end of our talk, we will discuss the sources we use for this video in my blogs. And you can follow along in our script that we share on SlideShare. Please, we welcome interesting questions in the comments. Let us learn and reflect together. St. Nicodemus, the compiler of the Greek Philokalia, knows a little about St. Diodocus of Photiki, other than he was a 5th century bishop of Photiki in Epirus in northern Greece, in that he wrote works opposing the Monophysites and supported the Orthodox position in the Council of Chalcedon. The English editors of the Philokalia note that St. Diodocus reaffirms the writings and beliefs of St. Evagrius, plus he emphasizes the primacy of love, and the sacraments, and upon the heart as well as upon the intellect. Prayer is important to St. Diodocus. He attaches great importance to the continual remembrance and invocation of the Lord Jesus. Like the Didache, this beatitude by St. Diodocus begins with love. St. Diodocus teaches us, all spiritual contemplation should be governed by faith, hope, and love, but most of all by love. Faith and hope teach us to detach ourselves from visible delights, but love unites the soul with the excellence of God, searching out the invisible by means of intellectual perception. What is faith? What is hope? What is love? Our English editors of the Philokalia offer these definitions. Faith is the dispassionate understanding of God. Hope is the flight of the intellect in love toward that for which it hopes. And love is growing affection for those who abuse us. And knowledge is to lose awareness of oneself through going out to God in ecstasy. Now many of us would want to push back on this definition of love, but we must remember that this work was monastic advice for monks or men, mostly. This advice was not meant for women in the world who are in abusive relationships. For them and their children, the best advice for them is to first flee to a safe place. You do not need to be bullied or physically abused. Love in this definition is like the love in the Sermon on the Mount. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you and do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. So faith is knowledge, and knowledge is ecstasy, and hope is a flight of love. Such as the loving beauty in the Philokalia written in love, these writings of the Eastern Church Fathers that interleave the emotions and the intellect. The Eastern Church Fathers would agree with the modern psychologists who observed that the intellect and the emotions can never be truly separated, that our emotions affect our intellect, and that our intellect affects our emotions. Our thoughts and our feelings wrap around each other like the tendrils of flowering vines growing on a trestle. In other words, faith, hope, and love are not emotions that are only felt, nor are they merely intellectual abstractions. But faith and hope and love should be ceaselessly contemplated, treasures to be pursued by our prayers, treasures to be pursued in our spiritual reading, treasures that we should seek with all of our heart and with all of our soul and with all of our mind. As St. Diodocus teaches us, our intellect always delights in the law of the Spirit, while our flesh seduces us with enticing pleasures. We should be eager to read the Church Fathers, for spiritual discourse fully satisfies our intellectual perception, because it flows from God through the energy of love. We should wait for the illumination of a faith energized by love, for nothing is drier than rambling on about God when there is no love of God. St. Diodocus teaches us that whoever loves himself cannot love God, but if, because of overflowing richness of God's love, a man does not love himself, then he truly loves God. Furthermore, he who loves God both truly believes and performs the works of faith reverently. But he who only believes and does not love lacks even the faith that he thinks he has. This is the faith that is the seed that does not grow, because it is thrown among the rocks of the field. This is the faith that only has shallow intellectual roots. 
It is not the faith energized by love. Lord, we pray that we are not among those who only believe and do not love, whose love is not genuine, whose love is selfish, and whose love is not truly selfless. Now, many people would push back on this, since we are taught constantly in the modern world what seems to be the exact opposite, that you cannot love others until you love yourself. But this difference is really a difference of language and definitions. St. Diodocus and the other Eastern Church Fathers see the terms self-love and selfishness as interchangeable. But St. Augustine teaches that a proper self-love is essential to love your neighbor, but then he goes and defines proper self-love as selflessness, and improper self-love as selfishness. So St. Augustine is really saying the same thing as the Eastern Church Fathers, but with different language and different definitions. Also, the modern definition of self-love is really an injunction for self-care, which is more critical for laymen than for monks. We should all practice self-care, and the Eastern Church Fathers would respond that this is part of the self-discipline of forming good daily habits in our daily lives. So, when the Eastern Church Fathers teach that you should not love yourself, take that to mean you should not behave selfishly, that instead you should be selfless, loving your neighbor as yourself. St. Paul in 1 Corinthians testifies that God gives some wisdom, others spiritual knowledge, both by the same Holy Spirit. St. Diodocus teaches us that spiritual knowledge comes through prayer, deep stillness, and complete detachment, while wisdom comes through humble meditation on Holy Scripture, and above all, through grace given by God. Our love of God does lead us to a true love of our neighbor. St. Diodocus teaches us that when we begin to perceive the love of God in all its richness, we begin to love our neighbor with spiritual reception. We begin to love our neighbor deeply. When we are spiritually awakened, the bond of love is not dissolved. Our love is rekindled by the love of God, and with great joy we seek our neighbor's love, even if our neighbor has gravely wronged or insulted us. For the sweetness of God completely consumes the bitterness of the quarrel. The qualities of a pure soul are intelligence, devoid of envy, ambition, free from malice, and unceasing love for the Lord of glory. What is our purpose in life? St. Diodocus teaches that it is to fully perceive the love of God, and consciously in our heart, so we can love God with all of our heart, and with all of our soul, and with all of our mind. The man who is so energized by the love of God has already left the world, although he is still present in it. What is the chief virtue in the path to a more perfect love of God? Obedience, which encourages us to be humble towards our neighbor. Humility, which is a door leading to the love of God. Adam sinned because he lacked humility, but because Christ loved humility, and in accordance with divine purpose, was obedient to his Father, even unto the cross and death, although he was in no way inferior to the Father. Through his own obedience, he has freed mankind from the crime of disobedience and leads all who live in obedience back to the blessedness of eternal life. After obedience comes self-control, which is common to all the virtues. Self-control means living in moderation, not eating to excess, avoiding rich foods, avoiding excess drinking, observing the fast, and not allowing the pleasures of the world to be the center of our life. St. Diodocus teaches us that those pursuing the spiritual way should train themselves to hate all uncontrolled desires until this hatred becomes habitual. The bodily senses are opposed to faith, for they are concerned with the objects of this present world, while faith is concerned only with the blessings of the life to come. Obedience and self-control, when practiced daily, leads us to change our souls through our changing of our daily habits. St. Diodocus teaches us that when a bad habit has been subjected to a good one through the energy of grace, it is destroyed along with a remembrance of mindless pleasures. And thereafter the soul gladly journeys on all the ways of virtue. And this advice of St. Diodocus was directed to monks. What does it teach to us who are laymen, who are married with kids? Does our saint tell us not to look forward to the weekends when we can go to the movies and the beach and enjoy our time with our family? Our family is ours to enjoy, as the psalmist sings in Psalm 127. Sons are indeed a heritage from the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the sons of one's youth, happy as the man who has his quiver full of them. 
And also the psalmist in Psalm 104 also sings these praises. You, Lord, cause the grass to grow for the cattle and plants for people to use, to bring forth food from the earth, and wine to gladden the human heart, oil to make the face shine, and bread to strengthen the human heart. These are the psalms that the priests preaching to their flocks in villages and towns uh, particularly love. They would no doubt teach us that we should enjoy our time with our families, but you should not eat to excess or drink to excess or spend our vacation in excessively expensive hotels. Sharing our love for each other should be the rhythm of the weekend, not showing our anger or fighting, enjoying our time together, and including Sunday worship as part of the natural celebration of the weekend, staying for the coffee hour and becoming friends with the other families of the church. St. Theodokos echoes St. Mark the ascetic when he teaches, Faith without works and works without faith will both alike be condemned. For he who has faith must offer to the Lord the faith which shows itself in actions. Our saint says that the depths of faith are like the waters of Lethe, making us forget all evil. In Greek mythology, the waters of Lethe is the river of forgetfulness in Hades. The shades of all departed must drink from these waters to forget their earthly life. The Holy Spirit helps us to love God. St. Diodocus teaches us only the Holy Spirit can purify the intellect. To guard our soul against evil, we must make ourselves a dwelling place for the Holy Spirit. We tend to think of the Holy Spirit as the emotional aspect of God, but St. Theodokos teaches that the Holy Spirit strengthens the intellect. When we practice self-restraint, the intellect longs to pursue heavenly beauty. When the Holy Spirit takes hold of us, do we no longer need to strive towards God? Do our emotions overpower us so the Christian life becomes automatic? No, we must always be attentive when living our lives in this imperfect world. The Holy Spirit strengthens our strivings toward the holy. But we must strive, as St. Diodocus teaches us, that the intellect, when it is triumphed over the thoughts of the flesh, knows for certain when it is tasting the grace of the Holy Spirit. For it is written in Psalm 34, Taste and see that the Lord is good. St. Diodocus teaches that when the energy of the Holy Spirit is within us, the soul is kindled into love for God and free from all fantasy and image, moves untroubled by doubt towards him, drawing the body with it into the depths of that ineffable love. The love which comes from the Holy Spirit so inflames the soul that all its parts cleave ineffably and with utter simplicity to the delight of its love and longing for the divine. When writing on the Philokalia, I felt that perhaps I should just repeat excerpts and not say anything more at all. And this is particularly true when St. Theodokos teaches us about praying in the name of Jesus. Our intellect, when seeking to remember God, we need to do nothing but say the prayer, Lord Jesus. As it is written in 1 Corinthians, No one can say Lord Jesus except in the Holy Spirit. Let the intellect continually concentrate on these words within its inner shrine, with such intensity that it is not turned aside to any mental images. Those who meditate unceasingly upon this glorious and holy name in the depths of their heart can sometimes see the light of their own intellect. St. Theodokos continues, When the mind closely concentrates on this name of Lord Jesus, then we can grow fully conscious that the name is burning up all the filth which covers the surface of the soul. As it is written, Our God is a consuming fire. Then the Lord awakens in our soul a great love for his glory. For when the intellect with fervor of heart repeats his precious name, then his name implants in us a constant love for its goodness, since there is nothing now that stands in the way. This is the pearl of great price which a man can acquire by selling all that he has, and so experience the inexpressible joy of making it his own. Here we see Diodocus teaches us that when we pray, we pray in the Holy Spirit, we pray with our intellect to pray with our heart, that the proper training in the intellect makes the heart grow fonder of the Lord. Our intellect is what separates us from the passions that can drag us down to the level of the beasts in the field. What keeps us from the remembrance of God? St. Theodokos teaches us that our intellect cannot hold fast to the remembrance of God, no matter how hard we try when our soul is disturbed by anger, confused by drunkenness, or sunk in deep depression. Lord, may we not allow our soul to be disturbed by our anger against our neighbor. May we always be eager to forgive our neighbor his faults, so anger never clouds our soul. 
and St. Theodokus continues, Since we are but children regarding perfection in the virtue of prayer, we pray that we have the Holy Spirit's aid so that all our thoughts may be concentrated and gladdened by the inexpressible sweetness of Jesus, so that with all of our being we may aspire to the remembrance and love of our God and our Father. St. Theodokus teaches us in many paragraphs that we should not allow our lives to revolve around seeking justice when our enemies wrong us. He teaches us that it is better to endure the lawlessness of those who wish to wrong us, and to pray for them so that they may be released from their guilt through repentance, rather than seeking to recover what they have taken. Divine justice requires that we receive back not the objects of theft, but the thief himself, freed through repentance from sin. And it is much better to lament the insensitivity of the unjust than to hate them. For even though they should deserve our hatred, it is senseless for a soul which loves God to be disturbed by any hatred, since when hatred is present in the soul, spiritual knowledge is paralyzed. Now that goes without saying that if somebody steals from you and they cripple your ability to make a living and you have a family to feed, well then you're morally obligated to do what you need to do to take care of your family. And this reminds me of my favorite story about the Stoic philosopher Epictetus. Epictetus tells us of someone who stole his lamp one night. He got the better end of the exchange. For Epictetus only lost his lamp, but he kept his faith. The man who stole his lamp in exchange for the lamp, he consented to be a thief, becoming faithless. And the good Saint Theodokus is merciless. He even wants to beat up on me when he teaches me that my intellect often finds it hard to endure praying because of the straightness and concentration which this involves. But it joyfully turns to theology because of the broad and unhampered scope of divine speculation. To keep our intellect from expressing itself too much in words, or exalting itself unduly in its joy, we should spend most of our time in prayer, singing psalms, and reading the Holy Scriptures. Yet without neglecting the speculations of wise men whose faith has been revealed in their writings. And study less, pray more, study of prayer must lead us to pray. St. Diodocus teaches us that the dreams we dream, through our love for God and God's love with great gentleness, approach our soul and fill it with spiritual gladness. When we awaken from these pleasant dreams, our soul longs to recapture the joy given to it by the dream. Why do we dream? The Lord may have spoken to Joseph through his dreams, but the Eastern Church Fathers say that it is wise for us to disregard any divine revelations made during our dreams, for fear that they are merely delusions. Do our dreams mirror our subconscious? Or are our dreams merely a random replaying of our thoughts, as science suspects? The Church Fathers clearly teach that not only can we control our passions during our waking hours, but we can even control our passions in our sleep. Now, we may be less enthusiastic about our nocturnal control with our scientific knowledge today, but we can certainly be sure to make nightly prayers a habit so we go to sleep without any anger in our souls. So St. Paul exhorts us. So then, putting away all falsehood, let us speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not make room for the devil. Now we'll discuss the sources we use for this video. Uh, the work by St. Diodocus is found in Volume 1 of the Philokalia, and I find the Philokalia enjoyable to read. We also recommend this book covering the Philokalia, although it does not have any articles uh, devoted to works by this particular saint. Information and excerpts from the works of this Eastern saint can be found on the website below. Many of our icons we download from this website, so we like to mention it in our videos. And one of my hobbies is taking photographs of icons and stained glass windows of the churches I visit. The St. Pekka Serbian Orthodox Church is across the street from St. Stephen's Orthodox Church in Longwood, Florida. And this is the picture of the monastery in Mount Athos we use for a thumbnail. The YouTube description links to our video script and our blog. Please support our channel by sharing this video with your friends and by clicking the like and subscribe button and by clicking on the Amazon links to purchase any of the books we discussed, and please consider becoming a patron of our channel. And please click on the links for interesting videos on other topics that will broaden your knowledge and improve your soul. Thank you.